Open Source Intelligence, aka OSINT, is a rapidly growing source of quality data and information. OSINT is useful information that is assembled from publicly available sources, from large-scale strategic military intelligence efforts across the world to researching your sketchy neighbor across the street, the capabilities of OSINT are seemingly limitless. The war in Ukraine has proven the usefulness of open source data in warfare, and intelligence agencies across the globe have taken notice. New national security priorities and strategies are forming to rely on open source intelligence as a vital piece of the intelligence pie. Joining me today are Nico Deccans and David Wells from Shadow Dragon, a leading provider of open source intelligence tools and training. The gentlemen have over three decades of experience in OSINT, and the discussion was absolutely fantastic. We talked about how the OSINT process works, how to think like an OSINT analyst, how to locate targets like human traffickers, and how anyone can validate news and information. And of course, how the intelligence community should be leveraging open source information. I was thoroughly impressed by the depth and knowledge both men possess. My key takeaways are, one, OSINT is a much more robust and useful source of decision-making than I ever thought. And these two gentlemen definitely illustrated that for me. My favorite quote was, even bad guys order pizza. Make sure you watch the full podcast for the context. I started this podcast in an effort to reveal free and accessible information about intelligence in a frictionless and entertaining fashion. Please subscribe on YouTube and leave a review on Apple Podcast so we can continue to create free quality content. The more subscribers we have, the better guests we'll be able to access. My name is Nick Smith. This is the NDS Show. Enjoy Nico and David from Shadow Dragon talking about open source intelligence. Hey, I'm joined today by a gentleman from ShadowDragon.io, Nico. How does this OSINT stuff work? Oh, that's a good question. So um, for those who do not know, OSINT stands for Open Source Intelligence, which means that you're basically trying to derive information from public sources that should be accessible for anyone and anyone, everyone around the world. Um, But it only becomes actionable intelligence once you've um, turned that information and you process that information into, let's say, an analysis product where someone else can make a decision upon. So... Think of open source intelligence as, hey, the internet is an open source by itself. There are closed mm-hmm. sources on the internet that are not accessible for everyone. So that's not OSINT. Uh, but everything right. that's publicly available, like a newspaper or a social media post that the person who posted that deliberately took the choice to share that with the world, that's open source. But also a good old library or a TV show or a radio show. So right. everything that's accessible for any individual all around the world. Okay, I've been having discussions on this topic, which are, you know, open source intelligence uh, isn't necessarily a traditional int in the intelligence community, right? Like in the intelligence community, you have things like GeoInt, Mm -hmm. SIGINT, AllSource, HUMINT. OSINT can really comprise all of those things. Um, Mm -hmm. So how would you how would you describe it in that sort of terms like it? Does it belong as a separate int or is it a whole entire field uh, that can contain all those different ints? So I'd like to answer this one if you don't mind. Yeah, so, um, and the reason I like to answer this, so I come from very heavy OSINT background uh, within the government. And it's funny that you said that OSINT is kind of a new int. There's some truth to that. However, the contrary to that is OSINT has been around for a very, very long time. We're talking like the earliest reading BBC articles, listening to radio broadcasts, exactly as Nico said. If something was available to the public, it was OSINT. Back in World War II, they were doing it. We're doing it now. What has really changed about it was not necessarily that the end itself has changed, but the volume of information that is available in the open source realm has really changed. Now you've still got radio broadcasts, you've still got newspapers, but you've got social media. Nico said, you've got Google Library, you've got Google Scholar, you've got those dark web sites that you can go to in your Tor browser if you want to download ITP. You've got Discord servers you can hang out on. I think one of the biggest issues that people really run into for the differentiation is 
I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to say this, but they assume because anybody can access it, it's very simple to do, which is definitely <laughs> not the case. I run into far too many people that come from those SIGINT backgrounds, that come from the MassInt backgrounds, that come from the human background, and they go, well, I've got access to Google, therefore I can be an O-Center. I'm not saying that you can't, right. but there is a very unique mindset that makes an O-Center effective that isn't necessarily the mindset that traditional ints bring with them. Because you've got that larger volume of information, you almost switch the dynamic. In something like Human, in something like SIGINT, in most cases, you've got very cultivated data sources. You know a little bit about the person mm -hmm. that you're interviewing or interrogating. You know about the asset flying overhead and has been tasked to fly over specific places to collect specific pieces of information. So you're dealing with a instance where you've got 99% signal and 1% noise. OSINT very much flips the script. Now when you're looking at all the data available to you, 99.999% right. of it is noise. Can you filter out that 0.001% of the signal? And ironically enough, despite the fact that it's such a heavier lift, yeah, anybody can go read Google News, anybody can log into Twitter, but because they consider it something anybody can get, what I tend to find is the training is so much more lacking. There mm -hmm. isn't that appreciation for that different mindset that both needs to be cultivated, needs to be found, and needs to be trained. Yeah. So you, men you mentioned that, you know, not just anybody with Google can be an OSINT person. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about maybe the process? Like what makes an OSINT person? What are the tools that they need to leverage? What are the processes they have to go through um, to access some of these things. You talked about the dark web. I'll, I want to dive in here. I want to get into all these, these fun tools and all this cool stuff you guys are doing. All right. Yeah, well, I, I think, think um, that's, that's something that everybody wants to know, the tools. But I think the tools are just a vessel that you sometimes need. It's more about the state of mind. So everything starts with trying to define an answerable research question. So um, give me everything on Nick means nothing to me because what is everything? Mm -hmm. Who's Nick? What do you mean with everything? Right. <laughs> so um, can you tell me if Nick presents a podcast? And if so, what podcast? Where does he live? Uh, who does he know? Those are questions I can work with. And with that, I will also know what tools I could leverage, what tools mm -hmm. not to leverage, but also keep in mind my operation security. Particularly when we um, do some digging on the internet, we ha also have something to hide, our digital fingerprint to our adversaries. Uh, but also the way that we move either lateral or in other ways that could give away that we have a certain interest. So with that, it really depends on what your goal and scope is, what kind of tools you are willing to use or you're, that you're going to pick from your tool set. Could be anything from a basic browser with one or two plugins that can take a screenshot or something, or have dedicated VPN connections or even dark web connections to um, get to a certain place that you otherwise cannot visit, which is still an open source, but you need maybe specialized software to gain access to that part of the internet because it's nothing more than an extra encrypted layer. So is there one tool? No, there is not one tool. There are multiple tools that will lead to Rome. The, I think the biggest challenge mm -hmm. is to, to ask those, well, maybe those basic um, uh, W1H questions, who, what, when, where, how, mm -hmm. Uh, with what? Those are questions that you always ask yourself. And based upon that, you can pivot or corroborate with what you already know. And it, and you also need a little bit of seed data. You need something to start with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm going to tell, you know, from an intelligence background. So uh, my focus is more likely to lean towards those kind of military intelligence questions. Mm -hmm. Um but I'm seeing OSINT used for all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. We're actually hosting a Skull Games uh, yep. team here uh, at my office this weekend. Um, and they're obviously there to fight human trafficking, which is awesome. Let's make sure we take all these human traffickers and throw them in a pit somewhere. Uh, but let, let's, can we maybe start with the military intelligence use case? Uh, recently, I learned about a couple uh, organization called Bellingcat that mm -hmm. was able to identify uh, how Russians shot down a Malaysian aircraft. Um, can, can we maybe start with a question like that and, and, and dig in there? So let's say you wanted to do something like confirm 
Russian troop movements? Like, where, where do you even begin with that sort of thing? Well, as Nico said, the first thing oh, that you that's have a good to question. Ask, I worked in. Oh, go, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So as Nico said, like the first thing you ha- need to have is that well-developed research question, or at least something other than what is China doing. Mm-hmm. And you've got to have that seed data. Right. Uh, so I'm guessing at this point, that seed data is either coming from probably some open sources, since uh, I would say, especially Ukraine has probably been one of the most broadcast open source wars ever fought. Or if you're getting it from classified channels, that's fine. You just need to have some sort of starting point that you can go out and search for on those open source realms. Now you need to ask yourself, what are the initial starting points that you have to look for? Do you have anything that you can narrow down this general location other than just it ha- it supposedly happened in Ukraine. Ideally, you've got something good. And again, this is where if you're coming from that military intelligence background, you can kind of combine some of those classified higher level sources with your open sources. Most likely, if you have those classified sources, you've got a pretty good idea about where Russian troops are stationed on the ground. And you can kind of filter down your research question to just those areas. And even if you've got your open sources, I can go to live UA map right now and get a pretty good idea about where the action is happening on the battlefield. If you've got those things, you can also kind of start to come out with certain keywords. Keywords are huge. Uh, I'm actually going to be speaking out osmosis and literally my speech is going to be on keyword selection. But if you know a little bit about it, again, you're pulling this from additional uh, from other sources. Somebody might be saying, hey, This is the munition that was used to shoot down or to conduct this attack. All right. So that munition can be a keyword. So the, yeah, those, those keywords, Mm -hmm. like where, so you're using, you're identifying keywords that are going to help you answer that intelligence question. Mm -hmm. How are you searching for those keywords? Like where do you even begin? It can be something. You mentioned the live UA map, so that's pretty cool. We'll definitely check that out. Yeah. It can be something as simple as a Google search. Thing about the Google is usually once it gets to that Google main page, it's been a little while. So you've got Twitter. uh, As much of a dumpster fire as Twitter can be from time to time, you can obviously go out on Twitter and do your basic searches. Um, But especially in uh, today's Ukrainian war, Telegram is a very huge place where that's happening. A lot of stuff. As we know from watching the news, it's happening on Discord servers. So you can go into places like those. Ideally, if you are Mm -hmm. invested and focused in this, you've got your uh, sources that you're looking for, be they those local newspapers that are reporting, be their radio stations. To the aspect of the tools, what I've just described is a very, very heavy lift. You're looking at those Discord channels. You're looking at the Telegram channels. You're looking at the radio stations. So ideally, you have some sort of tool. We at Shadow Dragon do make a very useful tool for that monitoring collection. Whatever the case is, you've got something that you can point at it to scrape all that information live and said, then search for those keywords that you found or that you've decided are probably going to be fruitful to you. The important thing that you said, though, and Nico said, you have to have some sort of research question. Again, I find that people come into this and they say, all right, well, I'm going to use OSINT. And what I'm going to answer is, what is Russia doing in Ukraine? What you have not described is an OSINT question. question. What you've described is a, you know, (laughs) months or years long doctoral thesis, which to some degree is OSINT, but not OSINT as we think of it. So, Mm -hmm. So would you define OSINT as being more tactical than strategic in its use? Well, both, I guess. Both. Mm-hmm. It really depends yeah. on the use case, but but maybe to, to come back on on a practical example that how, how you could, for example, use this. So recently, we have seen a lot of uh, Russian diplomats, quote unquote, diplomats being extradited mm-hmm. from numerous countries uh, because of right. reasons. So that will pop up <laughs> in any news uh, in any news outlet. And for example, there was one use case where in Sweden, all that was shared was a news article: "Hey, we extradited uh, a married couple." from Sweden at a certain location. Um, and that triggered. So all I had was a news article and a very vague picture in the background where I could see a, uh, a stairway going to what looked like an apartment block. So the first step would be is to do geolocation, kind of like geoint. So I tried to geolocate that specific location. Well, it took me a day or something. I found the location somewhere in Sweden, but now I have a front door, I have a number. 
Based upon that, we can take additional steps. So I can try to see, look in business registers or whatever, if someone used that address to sign up for some form of business. With that, I found two, um, two names, which are um, the names that those Russian spies used as their spying name. Uh, and based upon that, I could find more. I could find more. I can find other businesses that they used over the past 15 years, who they are connected to, uh, who they are friends with, where they have spent time. And with that, you can now potentially find, let's say, their entire paper trail and all their traces from their online personas for the past 15 years. We have a starting point, a news article, and nothing more than a vague picture of someone's front door, in essence. So that could be a very practical use case example. But from a military perspective, I worked at Bellingcat for a fair amount of time. For example, there was a video that went viral where um, in Syria, a rebel leader executed around 20 people. We've all seen those mm -hmm. videos where people were pulling those orange yeah. jumpsuits, the horrific stuff. Yes. So yeah. for accountability, the United Nations wanted to know who was involved, but exactly where and when this incident took place. So by simply looking at the location again, we could geolocate it um, somewhere in Syria. Then we could identify who was responsible for it, but we could also locate where they are now currently situated. So if you needed to arrest them or exfiltrate them, you could purely based upon open source intelligence find them. But you could also determine the exact location where the execution took place. And they even took samples from the ground where they could find the blood stains from the execution. So with that, we got validation that we found that location. And we could even tell the approximate time because the sun is the oldest clock in the world. And there was some shadow cast coming from the people who were responsible of that execution. So we could calculate back when this event took place. So if you're interested in looking at that, look at the Bellingcat site and look for uh, the All Well, well Folly killings. There's a short uh, blog and video about how that work was done. So yeah, you can really perform rocket science kind of research cases, but also low barrier stuff when it comes to this. Okay. You, you mentioned that, you know, maybe there's a misperception for people that get started in OSINT about uh, exactly what it is. If someone did want to get started and they were interested in, in this field, how, how would you recommend that they go about that? So actually, uh, you know, referencing Bellingcat, I think one thing that's very useful, and one thing I do like about them is most of their investigations, they will kind of walk you through the starting point and the end point of how they found that information. So realistically, if you can find uh, resources like Bellingcat or other OSINT resources out there, look through those investigations that they did and actually ask yourself the honest question, is this something that I myself could do on a regular basis? Do I have the time to, quote unquote, walk the dog on a map or go out to Google Maps and just move the little guy around so you find a front door that matches the front door in the picture? Realizing that when you're looking right. at those investigations that somebody like Bellingcat does, you it took you maybe like 10, 15 minutes to read all of that, but it probably took them hours, if not days, to do all of that work. And I do also think that's one of the things that kind of misleads people in what OSINT is and how it works. Again, coming from that training side, it's very, very tempting when you're showing people to only show them those successes. And you'll see this a lot is, hey, here's this awesome tool. I plug X in, I get Y out immediately. Or I'm going to do this reverse image search and immediately get some results. Or again, I'll walk that dog and within five seconds, I'll be able to figure out on the ground where that photo is taken. That gives people very much those uh, wrong expectations that that is how OSINT is going to be every time. That's quite the opposite. And I'm sure Nico will agree is a good investigation is not something that's just plug a handful of keywords or plug a starting point into a tool seconds later, get something mm -hmm. out. No, it is hours or in some cases days of a lot of failures with a small, small number of successes. Again, if you're not regularly to put in those hours and expect a lot of failures, again, OSIN is probably not for you. But for that starting point, look at what somebody else is doing and then realistically ask yourself, is this something that I could see myself doing as well? Yeah. And there's so many different areas that it mm -hmm. applies to from you know insurance fraud to 
uh, you know, military warfare. Um, but what are what are some interesting use cases for OSINT that maybe you guys are aware of that maybe most people wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't really understand? Um, you know what the actual capabilities are that you guys bring to the table. It could be anything. It could be anything from uh, tackling disinformation campaigns to uh, any form of fraud or met fixing to terrorism to child abuse to I don't know um, shopping. It, it really the palette is shopping. so broad. <laughs> anything, yeah. yeah. So no, well, you can use OSINT to to get a better deal. Uh, or that, that's right. what most people do. So if you're, if you're tra- trying to plan a holiday, uh, just by knowing how to operate your computer, you could get probably a better deal using the, the proper OSINT techniques or the proper setup to hide maybe a digital fingerprint from not from those companies not um, pushing up, let's say, um, the boundary of the amount of money that you need to pay for that holiday. Because if I VPN in right. from maybe Belgium versus the United States – where the United States official holidays, if you use a United States official IP address, will give you that price range. But if you come in from Belgium and now you're coming in from a different date, you might get a cheaper deal. So those are also ways to use open source intelligence mm-hmm. in your own maybe private life events. Or if you want to hire a babysitter, you can do some OSINT reconnaissance on, hey, what can we find out about the babysitter that makes us maybe uncomfortable? And we and that is something that that person did not share with us or discuss with us because mm-hmm. they're openly sharing that they popping Molly all the time or something like that. So that's, <laughs> right. yeah. And that's not uncommon that how people use it. Um, so no, the sky's the limit when it comes to open source intelligence. Yeah. I well, mean, the truth is everybody the, the, is doing that. OSINT research. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Everybody does that when they're shopping, right? You all, mm-hmm. I think there's a bunch of different add-ons you can get in Chrome that will kind of give you those, those types of features where it, It'll say, hey, you could have saved it if you did this. And that. Is this one um, you so tell people cool to use your honey use code? <laughs> no, code no, 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 no. I'm not pushing anything on, the, on this podcast. <laughs> um, but you, you talk, you're talking about a lot of things that people can do on their own accord. Mm-hmm. But who's paying for these types of investigation? Where's the, where's the money at that's paying for these things? And um, is it all CIA run? Oh, no, not not at all. Obviously, you know, coming from that DOD background, there is a lot of, you know, that government funding in there. I will not pretend otherwise. But as Nico said, like, really just about any question that you can think of is going to have an OSINT application. And uh, I think you mentioned like uh, insurance, really anywhere where there is a financial aspect where it benefits people to right. be able to look deeper for answers and also to know something before it makes it in the major news. If there's that financial aspect, then somebody is probably going to be willing to write a check Mm -hmm. to pay somebody to quote unquote do OSINT. Yeah, you don't have to look for CAA dark money to find OSINT money. Yeah, well, maybe a good example is the recent uh, bank run on the SVB bank that fell over. So we were monitoring that. And based upon that, we put in a bunch of keywords and we were capable of knowing at least 24 hours ahead of the rest of the world that there was also something wrong with Credit Suisse just by using Mm. uh, the right uh, sources to look, but also using the proper keywords to monitor, uh, let's say, financial unstable or unhealthy instances. So yeah, that's also a, a, a way to look at the world. Well, in the, in the instance of the SVB debacle, um, how are, how are you monitoring that? Like what you mentioned keywords, you, yeah, you had yeah. keywords you were looking out for. Um, like, can you give you some, maybe some more detail on, on how you went about that? Uh, so yeah, while while David pulls maybe something up, um, what I used is I okay. used all the known uh, American banks, all the known European banks and Asian bank, their names, basically the company names. And mm-hmm. that I try to combine uh, those bank worlds with um, bank run, uh, get my money out. Um, I'm uncertain. So let's say... Uh-huh. Um, people feeling uncomfortable or uncertain or other people that were talking negatively. So negative words surrounding the financial stuff. Based upon that, we got that early warning that a lot of people were seeing that credit squeeze were freezing credits for people or not allowing people to take money out of their bank or um, um, 
until mm-hmm. a certain amount. So that created more uncertainty, and with that, they were they got got into heavy weather. So so yeah. so you, so you use the sentiment analysis essentially, right? I mean, were you looking at were you looking at uh, a bunch of different things individually, or did you have some something that you're using to uh, aggregate sentiment for? Uh, Credit Suisse. So I mean, well, it's not sentiment because uh, computers have a hard time on, um, let's say, sarcasm and figure of speech. So it's it's really right. the the analysts' tax. So, but David, please gotcha. please go in there. Yeah, no uh, sentiment analysis has just kind of become a very uh, very popular buzzword. But I will tell you, anybody that has been in this realm for a while, uh, they will hear leadership saying, "Well, we want sentiment analysis," and our media response is. I appreciate that you think you want sentiment analysis, but you're asking a machine <laughs> to uh, dig through the vagaries of human emotion. A classic example is, you know, let's say that I've just got done listening to uh, Michael Jackson's album, Bad. And pretty much universally reviewed as a fantastic album. So I hop online and sit, talk about Michael Jackson's album, Bad, tell everybody what a good time I'm having, but what does sentiment analysis think when I talk about the album, Bad? It thinks right. that it is negative right. sentiment, think it's regardless, because it's it just sees a word like bad in right. there. Now, other things that you can look for, and again, this goes back to the aspect of keywords. There are certain keywords that people start using when things are going bad. They might reference thing like the, things like the panic of 1907, the 2008 crisis, even using something as obvious as the phrase bank run, or things like over leverage, overcapitalized, underwater, fair market value, realized loss. Mm-hmm. Anybody that's in finance could probably give you a list of indicators that tell you something scary is going to happen in like five or 10 minutes. But you put those together and I think what actually works better than sentiment analysis, no matter how good or bad that machine might be, is you actually start looking for the spike in conversation matching those keywords. Because for something like that, uh, you know, these quote unquote Twitter fueled bank runs, there's always going to be a little chatter in the background of this happening. When people start noticing that mm-hmm. chatter spikes very, very dramatically. And again, if you've got a tool, you kind of figure out what that baseline is and say, you know, if it gets like 100 or 200 percent above that baseline, now I need to look at it this a little bit more. And rather than rely on a machine for sentiment analysis, I can kind of individually start going through the through these, determine that analysis for myself and kind of come up with an idea. You know, maybe we might want to take our money out of this and ironically exacerbate that bank run, or if I'm the person running that bank itself, maybe I need to start putting out and do some messaging that kind of counteracts that because something has triggered people to start noticing, and this could be a bigger issue. That goes back to what I said. Anytime there's a financial incentive for OSINT, there's probably money for it. Banks have obviously a lot of financial sentiment. It very Mm -hmm. much behooves them to see those spikes before it starts making it into the BBC and CNN and those other news outlets. Uh, it definitely sounds like in the, especially in the financial world, uh, it makes a lot of sense for investors and portfolio managers to be investing in OSINT. I mean, is this happening across the board? Are, are companies investing into this type of, uh, I guess you can call it business intelligence, um, but open source intelligence for business is it, are, are you guys seeing a lot of that type of investment? Yep. Yeah. We're seeing, uh, I th- think it's safe to say that the past five years, there's been a huge spike in, um, those kind of companies that have reached out, for example, to us, but just in general, uh, I also teach certain classes, OSINT classes. It used to be mostly military and law enforcement, but now I think it's safe to say that almost half is either fortune 500 companies or oh, okay. uh, s- companies like that, that have uh, a significant interest in open source intelligence. Mm-hmm. Okay. um, One of the use cases you always hear about is human trafficking, right? Uh, It seems to be a hot item. I think Skull Games has really popularized um, OSINT as a method for um, getting after these scumbags Mm -hmm. that are trafficking children and women. Um, I I do want to dig into that a little bit, like how that that process works. But uh, to me, I'm always interested in the game of intelligence that's being played, right? The it's said oftentimes that counterintelligence is a forest of mirrors, right? You're just you're looking in, and you know things don't aren't exactly what they seem because th- 
people know they're being monitored. People mm -hmm. know they're being watched. What are what are some of the tactics that are being used to counter this type of um, intelligence gathering? And you know how how are you staying ahead of the game uh, so that you're not looking at the mirror? So uh, kind of a large part. Anyone take this one? Yeah, I hate to keep going back to the same place, but you've got to do. We like to call it social listening. So you actually listen to those enemies, and this could be reading newspapers and seeing what's being said. Once you actually get into those niche corners of the internet where they're hanging out, but identifying your, for yourself, what is unique about these conversations that is separate from the police talking about human trafficking or the FBI talking about human trafficking? I see a lot of people wanting to go into this and they'll have their tool or they'll have you know, their Google search bar, or Yandex search bar, and they say, all right, well, today I'm searching for human trafficking, so I'm going to type human trafficking into the search bar. I'm going to try slavery right. into the search bar. Obviously, that's not a, that might be a good very initial step, but that's not going to get you those successes in the long run. What works better is realizing that mm -hmm. these people have to have a way to be found. They cannot go completely dark. Otherwise, they're going to be very unsuccessful in their illegal financial ventures. So a classic one, um, mm -hmm. and again, I don't know if they're still doing this. I haven't looked at the human trafficking for a while. But a very effective way to traffic humans was you didn't tell people that you were going to illegally traffic them over lines, over uh, county, country lines. What you instead uh, did was you started advertising for certain job types, things like au pairs, things like maids. And there are certain words you could look for, like low skilled, mm -hmm. no experience necessary, younger female, certain age ranges. And what they would do is they would offer those jobs Young women in uh, impoverished areas would obviously be interested in them because, hey, now they're going to take mm -hmm. them from third world to first world nations. They're going to have these awesome jobs and they don't need any skill for it. Again, I'm coming from that mindset. It seems like a total win for me. What ends up happening to young women is once they get them over that country, oh, shoot, there's that job's not exist, doesn't exist for you anymore. But we've got something else we can do for you or just outright malicious. All right, now that you're over here, we're going to take your passport and any contact that you possibly have, and you pretty much have to do whatever we say. So again, you look for those specific words. You also start looking for those corners of the internet where they're hanging out using those words. I had a great case where um, I cannot remember the specific organization that I was working with, but they basically said, we have this guy. We know that he is involved in human trafficking. Now what do we do? I said, all right, well, what starting points do you have? They had his Facebook account. I'm like, what groups is this guy a member of? Like, groups? Why do we care about groups? I'm like, just trust me. Let's look at his groups. Sure enough, he was connected to like eight to 10 groups that were literally advertising for employment for those sorts of jobs that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, now that you've got that, look at other people that are members of those groups. Pull out those other members. Next thing that you know, you've got like a whole network of people that are just involved in moving young women across national lines, mm. in most cases explicitly for human trafficking. Now, their MOs might have changed. Again, I haven't looked at this in a while, but I guarantee you anybody that's looked at this, people that are going to the school games, they're going to start noticing commonalities amongst it. Certain job advertisements, certain keywords, certain phrases that are unique to those individuals, and again, certain corners of the internet where they kind of reside where they use those keywords. Once you identify those, you're pretty much in. And when they change the terminology, you're already in those places. You're able to spotlight it because like, hey, suddenly there's a new word or a new phrase that I don't recognize. I'm just going to put that on my CSV file. That way I know there's a new term that I want to track. So, I mean, you know, I mentioned the, the counterintelligence component of this. Um, it sounds to me like you know you're talking about Facebook groups. That's fairly open. I, get, I almost think you have to be idiotic to do it on there. But there's so many different applications now, different mm -hmm. social media apps. Like WhatsApp is obviously owned by Meta, but it's mm -hmm. supposedly encrypted. Signal's encrypted. Twitter says they're going to encrypt their DMs. Mm -hmm. um, you guys are talking about stopping things that are fairly, uh, I don't know, just seems like idiotic operations to me from a criminal standpoint. To be effective, they have to exist somewhere on that surface or open web. 
Like they, again, they can't go completely dark. They can't conduct their business entirely over WhatsApp because somebody has to know how to find them on WhatsApp. Somebody has to know to it, know to go to a specific discord server. Somebody has to know to subscribe to a private Mm -hmm. telegram group. So yeah, getting to those places where everything is encrypted in most cases that is outside the realm of OSINT, but before they enter in those spaces, that is what you're looking for. And, you know, if you're working with a government office, somebody with subpoena powers, somebody with more legal authorities, mm-hmm. or you're kind of talking to somebody who wears a more of a gray hat, you find those locations in the open web, then you kind of push that information into those darker corners over those people that have a little more authorities and capabilities. And don't forget that that a criminal was never born a criminal, at least most of them. So they have a history of not being a criminal. With that, they have a history of mm. traces online. But also, most criminals are not doing their criminal activities 24-7. So they might uh, go out to a gym or go out to a restaurant without doing criminal activities. And that gives us the capability to at least know where they are, where they spend time, with whom where and with that it gives us the opportunity again to take a look into their life and where to find them and where to see where they exploit their activities so that or pluck the fruits of um, the money that they collected from all their legal activities so there's numerous ways in all, always mm-hmm. yeah our cto so has a great like saying he a says product. bad guys order pizza too yeah, yeah mm-hmm. basically <laughs> that summarizes what yeah. nico says <laughs> yep they're not bad guys 24 7 i love it that mm-hmm. <laughs> Bad guys order pizza too. I love yep. it. Um, what well, you know? Uh, one of the most recent cases that's garnered a lot of attention has been Andrew Tate, and he's been accused of human trafficking. Are you are you too familiar with Andrew Tate at all? Unfortunately, yep. I haven't looked into him much, but yeah, I'm aware of him. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was curious if you had any further insight into his activities. Nico? No, well, no. Well, all I, all I can all I can tell you is that he leaves behind enough traces to almost spot on pinpoint him all the time where he is. And if you can do that, we wow. also have some capabilities to say if I know where your front door is, then I could also see, let's say, what other people are communicating from that location. So that may be, let's say, his yeah, helpers right. or helper friends or. Maybe the people being exploited because some of them still have access to social media because they need to advertise themselves. So, yeah, there's numerous ways mm-hmm. to to at least get a grasp of what's going on there. Well, it sounds like Andrew Tate might be in some <laughs> further trouble. I know they just released him, but um, that's obviously been a, a huge case that's been in the news. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts there on Andrew Tate? I will um, say, again, I haven't looked well, in them deeply, I've, but... Yeah, it looks like a lot of the news, um, you know, you look through the trail that they are sharing, the information that's made public, and there was a lot of stuff that he was saying and doing very much in the open source sphere. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, he was denying everything and saying it was all part of a plot to get him. But once you put together those open source clues, which I'm sure the agencies did that eventually arrested him, it kind of became like a little more obvious about the sort of behavior that he was I guess I should say allegedly uh, taking part in. So it's not like he was, again, not like he was doing everything in the dark. Mm -hmm. There were those traces on that, on the surface web or on the open internet. And as Nico said, once you find those, now you've got places that you can look for people like Andrew Tate and his ilk, allegedly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, I'm not an OSINT person, but I can just tell you, I've looked at some of his Twitter feed and things like that. And based on some of the stuff this guy says, he's guilty. I mean, he's got a he's got a hero complex. He's talking about, uh, you know, how he's a savior of this, this, and that. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm all for with the you know positive masculinity and all that good stuff that he he does promote. Um, but man, yeah. the guy just sounds like a human trafficker, doesn't he? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to disagree <laughs> uh, with you. There. Anyways, who who knows? <laughs> who knows? Um, it's it's such a massive. Um, undertaking. We are talking about these investigations. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, and I'm interested in, in where the funding coming from. I'm interested where which intelligence agencies are leveraging it to it their fullest. Um, how how should intelligence agencies go about leveraging OSINT? Uh, and, and I'll give you a background of why I asked this question. More recently, there's been a larger push in the intelligence community to push operations, at least segment operations, uh, with a larger share of those operations being unclassified, mm-hmm. right? So 
for example, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, the largest intelligence agency that no one's ever heard of. Um, they're building a new facility in St. Louis, and they're dedicating 25% of that space to unclassified operations. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your expertise, uh, and then maybe I'll go to Nico on this, mm -hmm. in your expertise, um, how should intelligence agencies be leveraging this vast amounts of data, you know, and, and should we be concerned about ethical considerations um, as well? We saw from the Twitter files recently, if you're unfamiliar with, with what's happening with Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, it was released basically intelligence agencies before Elon Musk bought it had unfettered access to Twitter direct messages. So mm -hmm. all those messages that people send back and forth, journalists sending it to their sources, whatever, the intelligence agencies had access to that. In the intelligence space, if you are going to spy on American citizens, uh, if you're in the US intelligence community, if you're going to spy on American citizens, you have to have a warrant from a FISA court. It has to go to a judge and get stamped. And there's got to be a really darn good case as to why that happens. Um, so I think there's, there's a mess waiting uh, there. Um, but from an open source intelligence perspective, how should the intelligence agencies be using it? And what are the ethical considerations we need to, we need to be paying attention to? Um, I think the how question is hard to answer. I, my answer would be they should just use it, period. If they're not using open source intelligence, you're not taking yourself serious as an intelligence agency anywhere around the world. Because mm -hmm. let's be honest, when we look at the world 25 years ago versus now, the information is mostly coming from open sources. I can tell you now that that more than 50% of all classified documents most likely contain information that I can reproduce from open sources, mm -hmm. even maybe more detailed. So when you look at some recent cases that, that broke the news, most of that information was to be found in open sources in greater detail. Doesn't matter from which country or what region around the world. Um, from the ethical perspective, um, all I can say is that I've only worked with, let's say, five, nine, I kind of countries. So I know from an ethical perspective, um, they are pretty limited to what they do. My, my concern is not at law enforcement agencies or intelligence agencies in those five, nine, I, 13 eyes kind of regions. No, it's more on companies that don't have the rules of engagement that don't have, let's say, those rules that they need to comply to. That's for me a bigger risk than an intelligence agency because they everything that they do needs to go through, let's say, a bunch of lawyers and legal kind of stuff within government. So it's pretty, when it comes to ethical stuff, doesn't mean that there are things going wrong and that works for any government. I'm from the Netherlands. Every now and then something goes wrong, but that's not, that's not, the ethical considerations are, I think, 99% the first thing that you do as an intelligence analyst or a team. Hey, um, the first question is, can I? Yes, we always can. But may I? That's a different <laughs> question. And that's for the legal department. Right. But I think it's safe to say when I look at my 25 years of experience of open source intelligence, working with all kinds of agencies all around the world, um, I'm not at all that worried about how they use and leverage open source intelligence. I strongly believe that they should use it more because it can mm -hmm. save them tons and tons of budgets of looking at closed sources or buying mm -hmm. information from closed sources or running uh, human assets to get information because most of that information is already out there nowadays. Does that answer your question? Oh, it, absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think I think most agencies in the United States anyways – uh, are focusing on OSINT. There are they do understand that it is a massive um, area of uh, opportunity for them to yeah. do what you're talking about, collect great data. Um, but there's also this at the same time, and of course, two things can be true at once. There's a skepticism of open source intelligence because you can fake it, and we're right. we're now starting to see the proliferation of artificial intelligence into almost everything. Um, yeah. Chat GPT can write an entire news article in two seconds. Um, yeah. Facebook has a text to video now. You can mm -hmm. put yeah. in text and it'll create an entire video. You see deep fakes. You see all these sorts of things. Uh, what do we need to be paying attention to there in terms of 
AI trying to thwart investigations or um, causing massive mis or disinformation. Uh, you can take Joe Rogan's voice, for instance, yeah. and put it over anybody's <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. face and and say whatever you want. So, uh, and he obviously has the largest platform in the world. Mm -hmm. So I've got to uh, yeah, I've got to you mention because again, coming from that OSINT background, working with a lot of government agencies, I would frequently hear that objection to OSINT. They would tell me, well, I don't like OSINT because it has to be validated or it can be wrong or it can be incorrect in some way. And the moment somebody would say that, I would follow up with the question is, question, are you telling me you're not validating your other int sources? If a detainee tells you something, are you not in some way validating what mm -hmm. that detainee says is accurate? If you happen to be yeah. flying a satellite overhead and you happen to see an interesting building, are you maybe flying it again or checking with other sources to make sure what that satellite is showing you isn't in some way incorrect? There aren't, weren't some weird shadows or clouds overhead. And invariably they go, well, obviously I'm validating other intelligence sources. And when at that point I'm like, all right, well, why are you creating this as a unique objection to OSINT? And usually they don't have an answer for that or it's easier to fake is the answer, which I won't necessarily disagree with that. On that note, though, when it comes to AI, when it comes to those deep fake videos, honestly, the validation process for that is for me the same validation process that OSINT has always had. I, I see a piece of information online. I see a video. Can I find the earliest source for that information? Usually, if you can find the earliest source for an AI created video, what you're going to find is it did not come from a legitimate source. It didn't suddenly just show up on I don't want to CNN or BBC's front page as accurate information. Usually it showed up on some random Twitter post or on a Discord account or, you know, obvious indicator it showed up on 4chan. If I see the first place something came from was 4chan, right. I probably know that there's some disinformation happening there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also we can use the same tools that are building those deep fakes to tackle mm -hmm. deep fakes. So for ChatGTP, there are ChatGTP checking tools that will tell you exactly, hey, with 99% certainty, this essay was written with uh, AI. We have a picture, hey, there are no actual pixels that were coming from a camera lens. So we can see by the pixel density that it was generated by some form of algorithm. So yes, it's a rat race. I think the biggest issue that we are dealing with now is uh, the scale or the amount of this information, um, it's simply more, which um, in the end means that we spend more time, just like David says, trying to validate these false or misinformation pieces. Well, you bring up a great point and a great question, uh, which is what can kind of the everyday person do to validate information? Like, are, are there some easy things? Uh, you know, I, I know in my own uh, way I, I, I obviously like everybody. I receive a lot of information, a lot of news. I'm on all the social medias and mm -hmm. all that stuff. I go on Google News a lot. Um, I'm always skeptical. Every time I see something, I'm like, I don't know. You know, I, I, my first every time I see a headline, I'm like, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I approach it. I always approach with a skeptical mindset. I know not everybody does. A lot of people mm -hmm. just tend to believe things they see and read, uh, which is insane to me. But, um. What are maybe what are some easy ways or methods for validating information? You know, if somebody sees something on Twitter that looks sketchy, um, is there a, a site they could go to? Is there a way they should approach trying to validate information? You want to take this, David? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, I hate to, you know, echo myself, but again, the main thing is going to be to find the original source. <laughs> now. How you do that is going to depend a lot on what it is you're looking at. So I'll give a great example. Anybody can look this up, but uh, I think it was um, a news story that was posted in, I believe, the BBC, but some some pretty well-known and well-established uh, mm -hmm. news source. But they were referring to a study that was done, basically saying all these school children took fish oils and the concentration in these children was improved dramatically by taking fish oils, which sound awesome. Uh -huh. Now, the problem that they ran into is if you actually look at the story, 
They didn't actually link to the original paper anywhere, which for me, anytime I see a lack of reference to the original source, that's a huge red flag to me. But what they did have in the story was the college that funded the study. They had keywords in there like fish oil or children or et cetera, et cetera, anything you can look up. The moment you look that up, maybe go to something like Google Scholar. Maybe you just go to your local library and look through their journal articles. You found the original paper. And what you found out was a couple things very, very interesting. Number one, the original research did not set out to measure concentration in children. Number two, they actually weren't using fish oil. Uh, they were using krill oil, which I guess has some biocompatibility with fish oil, but still definitely a difference. And uh, considering the amount of money that fish oil ma manufacturers made off the story, uh, very misleading. A lot of other things that were red flags that as soon as you look at that original source, like, man, what this uh, newspaper publisher is saying is actually not reflecting the reality of that original study. Again, you go to something like images, right. classic case, you're in Google, right click, do that Google reverse image search, figure out when the first time that image showed up online. I know there was a great one where a uh, during the Iranian protests, somebody posted a picture and it looked awesome. It was like a uh, lady wearing traditional, um, traditional Middle Eastern garb, like throwing a sidekick at a bunch of police wearing riot gear. And they said, this is Iran right now. Right. Somebody did a reverse image search of that and they found that it came from a movie, a promotional still from a movie like 10 or 15 years <laughs> earlier. Right. And when somebody called the person on it, they're like, oh, well, this reflects the sentiment of what's going on in Iran right now. Yeah. Right. Right. In, in every one of those cases, yeah. and in most cases, if you can find where that information is originally ordinate, originating from, you can make a reasonable assumption about how valid or invalid it actually is. Yeah. Yeah, check the source, check who else is reporting on it, but also mm -hmm. check who takes this message and spreads it elsewhere with what narrative or what intention. That also is a good indicator if you're dealing with something maybe sketchy. Yeah, uh, and what you're talking about is, a, you know, you got to take some steps there. You, could, you, should, you shouldn't just believe it um, <laughs> no. when you see it or, or read it, but uh, I have a feeling most people don't, well, don't take think, the time to do that. We're all I busy, right? I think the big right? one on there is jobs when you're skeptical. Oh, sorry. When you're skeptical, don't just be skeptical about those things that are contrary to your worldview. Be skeptical about things that confirm your worldview, because I think that's where most people fail. Right. So I've got, you know, family members that come from both right. uh, spectrums of political aisle. My very uh, mm -hmm. liberal sister, most of the stuff that she is going to read that, again, echo that very liberal perspective. She's going to say, yep, this is 100 percent true. Whereas if my dad saw that same story, he'd be like, no, I need to go and research this and figure out the truth of it. You flip the script. My sister reads something from Fox News. She's going to be very skeptical of that, where my dad's going to be like, yeah, this is the world truth. You got to meet somewhere in the middle right. and say, all right, maybe I should apply that level of skepticism to just about everything to correct my own thinking, to realize, you know, yeah. I might be a little all bit wrong. He's in bias. Yeah, be your own be devil's advocate. advocate. Well, yeah, it's be, be your own devil's advocate. Um, be aware of your own, uh, let's say, confirmation bias or other mm -hmm. fallacies that you have that are those fall pits that you come into. And, of course, checking and validating, that is the most time-consuming part within open source intelligence. And that brings us back to the beginning of this podcast where um, open source intelligence, in essence, it's, it's all about the state of mind with a lot of tenacity. Uh, you require so much tenacity when it comes to this, but also knowing when to stop and where to stop searching. Because sometimes you can spend an entire day looking maybe for a suspect, uh, but not finding something is could also be an answer because you know from your profession, hey, these are the places where you look for a suspect coming from that region in the world. The fact that you cannot find anything could also mean, hey, this person took some good countermeasure steps, or maybe I need to take a step back and work as a team, maybe do a brainstorming session and say, hey, this is what I've done so far. Let's do an analysis of competing hypothesis or something like that based upon, hey, this is what we got so far. Let's see what we overlooked. What are the gaps? What do we know? What don't we know? All these things, it's just traditional intelligence gathering, mm -hmm. but the only difference is that you're using open sources. And on average, that means that you're, you have way more available information because the internet simply contains way more information than any closed source right. out there. Uh 
previously we talked a little bit about how Ukraine is really the the war in Ukraine, of course, has really pushed OSINT into the limelight, if it were. We're seeing a lot of um, information shared through all the apps and stuff that we've talked about. Um, what, what uh, in, in your estimation, like what, what is that North Star for OSINT that, that the Ukraine war is really pinpointed? Like what, what are some ways that it's being used that's like, yes, that's what we needed. Like that, that's exactly the way we should be using OSINT. And then what are the gaps that maybe um, the nice to haves that uh, w- the areas maybe we can't quite reach with open source intelligence? You know, I know we talked a little bit about encryption and things like that. Um, but you know, kind of what what are the what are the highs and lows, and what are the what are the gaps within OSINT? I think the biggest gap is is that people want to see those closed spaces. So let's say we as free gentlemen set up a DMing group. Well, we will never get an insight into that because that's a closed ecosystem. That's not an open source. And most people that start out in OSINT want to see people's WhatsApp messages, want to see people's single messages. That's something that. W- you should also never aim for. That's not open source intelligence. That's closed source intelligence. You may be able to obtain that information with maybe forms of digital human, virtual human, or social engineering, or that kind of stuff. So there is a thin line between open source intelligence and human intelligence or cyber threat intelligence where you start interacting with targets. But keep in mind that you are now leveraging closed source information or somewhat closed source information. So that's, I think, the biggest gap. I think the biggest advances that we had in the couple of years to getting more momentum is you can see truth move, movements, you can see mm-hmm. buildups, uh, you can see uh, singles intelligence capabilities. So yesterday there was a, um, a group of people in Poland who posted all the embassies all around the world, Russian embassies, showing all the kinds of freaky antennas that they have on their roofs. Mm-hmm. And with that, you can learn a little bit about their capabilities just by using open source satellite imagery. So you don't need that very expensive satellite imagery Anyone with a working internet connection could figure that stuff out on their own. All you need is time and internet. So, yeah, there's a balance. Things are getting more encrypted and more decentralized, which will make it a little bit more challenging for people like David and myself to find information. But it's nothing more than a water bad effect. Um, For example, Facebook used to be the number one platform when it comes to social media. Now it's, particularly in Europe, it's mostly used by people above 40 years age of older. Mm -hmm. And the younger kids are on, I don't know, TikTok or Be Real or Snapchat, which means that we know we need to know where to look next. Mm -hmm. And based upon that, we adapt and adopt. Um, You mentioned something there that kind of caught my attention, which was interacting with with the target. Yeah. Is that, is that a common practice? Uh, have you had investigations like that where you've interacted with targets? I think that very much depends on the end user of OSINT. Uh, so coming from that government background, we had to make that very, very clear uh, to our students. And I would tell them like, if you are the sort of person that has the authorities to do that, you know, sometimes we'll call it cyber enabled human, then you are very aware that you are the, Mm -hmm. then you are very aware that you have those authorities. If you have to ask yourself the question, do I have the authorities to do cyber enabled human? Then the answer is no. That is a very, very small subset of the government that is actually doing that interaction. Because honestly, it takes an entirely different skill set. Yeah, Yeah, well, hey, 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 David, we're we're losing your audio here a little bit. Um, Maybe I can, yeah, we're kind of losing your audio a little bit. I'll I'll toss that question over to Nico, though, uh, which is, you know, what what needs to be in consideration if you're um, communicating with with targets, or is that like where's what in what scenario would you be communicating with the target? And yeah, well, it's it's it, it. I think it all depends on the risks that you're willing to take or that you're allowed to take in your investigation. So um, maybe from a practical use case example, let's say someone is selling um, illegal. So in Europe. Having a firearm most of the time is illegal um, or without a very distinct permit, but people want to buy a gun. So someone might offer a gun on the Tor network, on the dark web, or Mm. on a Telegram group. Um, 
But in order to order it, you need to communicate with that person because you need to know where to send the money. You need to understand mm-hmm. where to where they send or ship the, the firearm to. So you may want to communicate mm-hmm. with them. For most government employees, that's illegal to do unless you have this thing permission. But it also means something for your mission because now once you start communicating, it means that your adversary or the suspect or the end of the line could potentially find find out more because you now need to share your account. It's not passive anymore. It's active. Right. And that could pose a risk. So what does it mean? Do you need to have virtual machines? Do you need to have dedicated internet connections with dedicated VPN connections? Uh, what kind of wording am I going to use? Because if I'm going to communicate with a, let's say, a local firearms dealer versus a nation state hacker versus, I don't know, Uh, a super nerd that's selling leaked data, they all speak a different form of slang. And I need to now familiarize myself with that slang. Or I need to understand that someone is in a different time zone. And with me only communicating them from, let's say, my European time zone could give away that I'm from elsewhere. So there are numerous things that you keep in consideration. Well, I've done this stuff when I was in the government, for example, when someone was offering um, stolen databases from large companies that contain mm-hmm. very sensitive information, you wanted to, first of all, uh, communicate with them and get a sample to see if their offering was legit. Uh, based upon that, you could maybe get their email address because, hey, you needed to send something to them. And that I can now, now use for open source intelligence purposes, again, to learn a little bit more if they were sloppy. The other way around, I need to share something with them. So I need to make sure that I lock down my accounts so they cannot see more than I want them to see. So there are so many things to keep in consideration. And I just want to point out that this is not open source intelligence. As soon as you communicate with (laughs) someone, it's human intelligence or digital human intelligence. But yeah, there is that there's there's a need for it. And there's an increasing... um, need for it because more and more groups are in more closed spaces just general stuff let's say Mm -hmm. uh, well in my country now we have a situation going on where we have a lot of people that are angry with the government so they want to organize demonstrations and rallies so for civil unrest Mm -hmm. for that perspective law enforcement wants to know where certain demonstrations or rallies are being organized so it could be as simple as going into a telegram room where 3,000 people are active and just asking in general to the room, where's the rally this weekend? But it is communicating. <laughs> right. And there's always yeah. someone willing to answer, hey, it's at 4 o'clock mm-hmm. at that square. And now at least you know where to put the riot police just to be on the safe side a little bit. So right. it could be very low barrier, but it could also be very intrusive, but also privacy invading to someone who you label as a suspect, but could also very well be not someone who should be labeled as a suspect. So there's a thin line you're walking. I gotcha. Um, so it sounds like a kind of a cat and mouse game there. Uh, yeah. And it sounds like in, in general, it's really a cat and mouse game. And like I said, I don't know much about OSIN. I really don't. I've learned a lot from you guys today, but uh, I'm still trying to put the pieces together in my mind. It sounds to me like you want to approach something first with um, non-attribution. You don't want people to know where you're coming from. You don't want them to know who you are, or where you're coming from. Is that step one? Am I right there? It's and a, then um, step two is, I'm sorry. Uh, step step two is, you know, um, you you want to start to answer that question, that intelligence question, by uh, leveraging those keywords, searching on the tools that you have. And then step three is is maybe. Uh, I don't know, go, taking it to the next step, which is, uh, you know, identifying where those targets are um, and, and how they're communicating. Is Did I hit that on the head or am I off? Yeah, no, that's that's did pretty good. Are you, able, are you able to hear me right now? Am I coming in? All right. Excellent. I can, David. I can. Thank you. Okay. Yep, uh, so yeah. So yeah, step one. And I do want to kind of highlight something on that. So I think when people talk about that manage attribution and a non-attribution piece, what they miss is they need to think about mm-hmm. where they're collecting for information. A lot of times people have those really robust managed attribution systems. I don't want to go into what those may or may not entail, but they're doing it because they want to do a quick search on Twitter or they want to read the Google News headlines. That's Mm -hmm. probably not very necessary. When you're going to want that non-attribution piece is when you're going to places on the Internet where you don't want them to be able to look at your request and identify what your local machine looks like, your IP address and other pieces of information. Um, once you've kind of answered those questions, 
you've got that appropriate managed attribution system for the research that you're doing, 100%. You want to start identifying those corners of the internet that people are hanging out on and those keywords that they're using. And again, if you're just starting out, something as simple as a Google News search for the research topic that you're doing can be very useful. Mm -hmm. Start skimming through those articles and saying, all right, well, here's a unique location that I can look at. Or here seems to be a spokesperson for this organization. I can grab their name. Here's a couple unique aliases that I can follow. From that point on, structure your search in such a way that's just looking for those keywords. That in most cases is going to kind of start pointing you toward those corners that they're hanging out in. And even better yet, finding new sets of keywords so you can better monitor those individuals. It's very, very much an iterative process. Again, to go back, people very much want that. I, I plug in X, I get Y. That is not the case of right. OSINT in most cases. It's pretty much as you kind of mapped out. Right, you got your initial step for that initial research. After you got that initial research, it's that deeper look. After even that deeper look, it's that more fine-tuned, very focused. I'm going to stare at this very specific corner of the internet and these group of people for an extended period of time mm -hmm. and also see how their conversation evolves so I can keep looking at them. Yeah. Uh, what, what, one of the interesting use cases was, uh, have you guys seen this, this person that was tracking Elon Musk? Yeah. Uh, jet. This yeah, private jet. Travel movement? Yeah. How how yeah. how the hell did he do that? Oh, that it's is just an open are, source. So there's ADSB exchange, Flight Radar Twenty Four. Yeah, there are so many websites that do that, and all you really have you can actually get your own uh, little ADSB uh, radar or whatever track planes that are flying over your head and put in that larger database just so it's a little bit more refined. That's if you're flying a plane, doesn't matter well, what you it's need a tail number. Yeah, so. Okay, don't so do this, if you have the tail I number, mean, you can basically track any private jet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so don't do yeah, this. Or the pilot's name or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A game I used wow. to like to play is uh, I would be overseas back when I was still in wear a green suit, and I would play the game Spot the Covert Aircraft. And what you would see is you would see certain aircraft yeah. types flying in certain locations. They're obviously not going to say, all right, this is a CIA aircraft or this is a FBI aircraft. But you look at the model number, you look at the make, and you also do a quick little research and you'll see it's being advertised by Boeing and it will say something very obvious like, hey, this aircraft can be uh, outfitted with certain pieces of surveillance craft or surveillance equipment. Mm -hmm. From that, you're like, all right, I probably yeah. got a pretty good idea right. that this is not somebody that is moving uh, legitimate cargo from point A to point B. And especially when you see the sort of airports they're taking off from and landing, it's a pretty good indicator of what's flying overhead. Yeah. Yeah. And especially for, for commercial planes, it's super easy to track. Military is a little bit more challenging, but even that can be done because they have the capability to turn or spoof uh, certain signals. But if you have, let's say if you have Bezos, Gates and Musk meeting in one place, all we need to do is track their tail number. And based upon that, we could say, well, maybe there's a merger coming up or something like that. So right. from that perspective, it's super interesting to monitor anything that can fly, drive or float somewhere. All those all those vehicles can be tracked. I mean, there's you just brought up another use case of OSINT, which is tracking people's movements to determine, you know, and forecast what business uh, deals that <laughs> might yep. might happen. Um, that's yeah. that's crazy. There's just so many there's so many use cases for it. It's just it's insane to me. Um, I wanted to really talk about what you guys do at Shadow Dragon. Maybe you could could give us a rundown of what Shadow Dragon is and kind of what your day to day is like. Um, at Shadow Dragon. David, go ahead. All right. Yeah, so actually, I kind of want to answer that question. I think the best thing to do is kind of talk about the beginnings of Shadow Dragon. So uh, the individuals right now okay, that are great. leading Shadow Dragon yeah. were pretty much the originators of Shadow Dragon. And when I talk about this very time-consuming process, they very much agreed with that. Uh, but they were, they were and are very, very intelligent individuals. And they realized, you know what, these very long-consuming processes there's got to be some way that we can automate them. So for things like monitoring certain mm -hmm. channels online, subscribing to news feeds, yeah, I can manually go out there and read those, but there's got to be a way to automate that. For things like the social media, being able to look at a social media platform and really quickly scan through somebody's posts and see if they're using certain keywords 
Again, that can be a very tedious process. Is there some way to automate that? Their answer was very much yes, and how do we do that? From that point on, they were able to create a suite of tools. So we've got tools like OI Monitor, Malnet, uh, Horizon. They all allow us to automate processes that would otherwise take hours. The one thing I really like about that is I mentioned that a lot of times when you're doing OSINT, you fail. And I want to reiterate that for anybody that is planning on getting this. If you're going to do OSINT, you're going to fail. What I really like about our tools, and it's true with some other tools as well, if you're going to fail, you're going to fail very quickly. Within 15 seconds, within maybe a minute or two, you're going to get those null results that if you're trying to do all those processes manually, it would be taking you hours to do it. I would much rather get a failure in a couple minutes than a failure after hours and just bang my head against the desk and say, all right, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when, okay. just, maybe, just maybe a quick example on, on mm -hmm. the, so the collection part is what we scale up, what we make easy. I remember vividly when I was in the government, I was doing a research case on a terrorist cell that was uh, active in Europe, uh, Islamic State terrorist cell, and I spent mm -hmm. on my own uh, more than a month, 10 hours a day, six days a week working, and that created a, let's say, a certain right. picture. Um, now... I did exactly the same to reproduce it in our tool. And I was I collected the data in under an hour. It still means that you need to analyze it, but it saved me more than three and a half weeks of work by simply collecting wow. it. It even found more. It also found some false positives, but it gives you so much capability to quickly collect data at scale and make sense of it and then start to analyze and pivot and corroborate that. And that's, I think, the biggest power of, of social net in Horizon, where where you get to look in over 200 sources on the internet um, in bulk super fast. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, just like so, David said, so yes, tool, you will fail. So the tool, you, you mentioned one social net. Is that, is that yeah. right? Um, yeah. Is it essentially allowing you to access all the social networks uh, and a, do those keyword searches? Is that what it does? It is allowing you to access what's public. I want to be very clear on that. So we are not hackers. We don't want to cross that legally okay. or morally gray area. But right. for the most part, if information is right. public, it very quickly allows us to find that, pivot off those things, look for things like keywords, look for things like groups that they are members of, friends that they are in common, interests that they have, and then move mm -hmm. from there. Again, stuff that you could do manually, but it's going to take you a very, very extended period of time. One thing that we don't do, and I kind of want to highlight this because I think it's important, we don't mess around in that AI space. We do not want to say, here is a tool that's going to do the thinking for you. Because down that path leads major, major issues. What we are going to say instead is, hey, those sort of processes that honestly don't require thinking, that are just rote clicks on the keyboard, let us automate those for you. Those for you. That way, the things that require a human to think, mm -hmm. you're able to get to those much quicker than you would be able to otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so are you guys also providing services as well, or is it, is it just the tools you're providing and then, you know, who's, who's, uh, purchasing them? Yeah. We tend not to get in the service game. Yeah. There, there's a little bit of that and it's mm -hmm. very specific for very people for specific use cases, but as for who's buying, it goes back to what I said. If there's a financial incentive to leverage OSINT, which in most cases there is, chances are those are people that are either our current customers or are interested in becoming our customers in the future. There are certain people that we're not going to sell to. We look at things like certain watch lists and whatnot, and we get an email from them. We're like, yeah, you're not the sort of people we, we want to deal with. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We do. We do a lot of vetting when it comes to that. And, and, and again, we own, we don't collect data. We, let you search for data in open sources. So it's not, that, let's say that we have an entire data center that has already pre-scraped the internet. So mm -hmm. as soon as you right. ask for information, you're going out in real time uh, to collect that data from open sources. So that information is publicly available. But it also means that, let's assume you have a account on Instagram and you post something mm -hmm. and you make a decision, uh, maybe it was a bad idea. This, as soon as you delete that post, we are no longer capable of collecting that data because it's no longer publicly available. 
So that's also good to know that that we don't we don't collect data on our own. We let you collect data in real time using our platforms. Okay, awesome. Um, so how how can people reach out to Shadow Dragon if they're interested in in this OSINT game, playing this game of mirrors? Like I yeah, I, most so obvious thing is just I going to our website. Yeah, shatterdragon.io. There's a nice yeah. little contact page. Fill out your information. Uh, one thing to note is, again, because we want that vetting information, if you are going to email us, have like a work or business email that you're emailing. We get very sketchy if we see like Gmails mm -hmm. or Hotmails coming in, just because who could That's that true. person possibly, at least if there's a legitimate business domain, <laughs> we can do a quick little uh, sanity check and make sure you're somebody we want to deal with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I do want to highlight one other thing that we do as well. Um, in addition to the tools, uh, we provide some very robust and very detailed training. So, you know, Nico comes from that training background. We've mm -hmm. also got um, Olivia Gronsbach. She comes from a training background where she's trained people like the special operations communities, various three-letter agencies. Uh, they are working on and have developed some, in my opinion, very, very awesome training. And the reason I want to highlight that is because, again, I think a lot of the time people forget about that aspect of it. They think because it's something anybody can access, training isn't necessary. Mm -hmm. Coming from a previous hat right. that I used to wear, I would see government agencies purchase like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of tool licenses for individual analysts. And they're like, all right, well, let's kind of talk about training. And like, well, we don't have more than two hours to train per analyst. I'm like, well, what kind of <laughs> right, sense does right. that make? There's no reason whatsoever to buy these tools if you're not going to train them in how to use these tools. And for some reason in their minds, training just was not necessary. Yep. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. uh, you, you we teach that a methodology, lot. not buff buttonology like our yeah. CEO says. <laughs> um, you see that a lot in the military space where mm -hmm. they want the tools, but they forget they also have to they have to yeah. spend some time learning this stuff. It doesn't happen naturally. You know, you, it doesn't happen by osmosis. Um, very good. Very good. Uh, well, is, is there any other uh, topics you'd like to hit on before we hop off? Hmm. No, what not necessarily. I, I, I just want to say to all the people, to the audience, hey, if you have questions, feel free to reach out and, and just know that open source intelligence is not going away and it's not just a hot new kid in town has been here for decades and probably will be here for more decades awesome appreciate it if you're interested in reaching out to david or nika we'll put their information in the description um if you're interested in learning more about shadow dragon we'll also put links in the description make sure you check those out subscribe on youtube if you're on youtube leave us a five-star review on apple Podcasts, spotify wherever you listen to your podcast and make sure you check out the NDS show. My name's Nick. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you very much.